As Brother Chip has said, it's good to see each and every one out with us this morning, especially if you're visiting with us. We're glad that you are out and able to be with us. If you're here and not familiar with the Church of Christ and you have questions about what we do in our worship services and how we conduct our services, every week I offer this challenge. It's very simply, ask us, ask us why, and we'll provide for you a Bible answer for the reason we worship in the way we do. As we continue our thoughts this morning, we're on lesson number four out of five on the story of the cross. We began our series speaking about the cross being a prophetic story. And then the next week we talked about the cross and a purposeful story. And last week we spoke of maybe, maybe the hardest of all the lessons for us to be able to to take, and that is that it was a painful story. As we talked about the sufferings that our Lord and our Savior went through, but this morning we want to talk about the story of the cross, a pleasing story. As Brother Paul read for us from Isaiah chapter 53, when you look in verse 10 and verse 11, when you read those verses, it pleased the Lord. It pleased Him to bruise Him. It pleased God for His Son to be bruised. And then you go on down. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in His hand. A pleasing thought that His will will prosper through the hand of Jesus. And as I look at that passage and I think about that <coughs> passage, let us understand this morning that there is a difference in the will of the Lord and the pleasure of the Lord. The will of God is that which is to be accomplished. The pleasure of the Lord in the story of the cross is how His will was going to be accomplished. Understand there are times when God will allow things to happen, but He may not take pleasure in those things. Think about our own life, if you will, in that instance. God will allow us to make our choice. Does He take pleasure in every choice we make? No. You see, so when we think about this pleasurable and pleasing nature of the cross, what we ought to be interested in is whatever our Lord takes pleasure in, we must also take pleasure <clears throat> If God has no pleasure in any given thing, then we as His people should not have any pleasure in those things. So what I want to do this morning in it kind of confused Kay as she proofread this lesson because the first three points speak about how the cross is pleasing to God. But then the end of the lesson speaks in a different way about how you and I should use the story of the cross to be pleasing to God. So several points this morning and we're not going to dwell and spend a lot of time hopefully on each and every one of these but I want you to understand that the story of the cross pleased God. And first of all, understand that it pleased God in the very person of Jesus Christ. When you begin to read in the book of Matthew chapter 3 and in verse 17, you remember Jesus has just been baptized. And verse 17 says, And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus, the person, was pleasing to God in the fact that first and foremost, He was baptized as an example for you and for me. But then I go to Matthew chapter 17, in the story of the transfiguration of Jesus, where He takes Peter, James, and John up to the high mountain. But look at verse 5. 
While he was speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Here it is in these passages that we have the Lamb that will take away the sin of the world. Brought before the very eyesight of God for examination. And the purpose of this examination is, is Jesus going to please God or is he going to displease God? Here it is, not only is he without spot, without blemish, but with all that he did, in all that he did in his life, according to what I can read in Scripture, God was well pleased. And understand in my mind what this is saying is it is more than just mere satisfaction. You know, when, when our children brought home their report cards, one would bring home real good grades and the other one would bring home average grades. I was always well satisfied with the one who brought home the good grades. But you know, I started thinking, Every child is different. I should have been satisfied with the one who brought home the average grades too, right? You see, I should have taken pleasure in both of what my children did when it came to their grades in school. But what I'm looking at when I think about Jesus and how He was pleasing to God, it was more than just pleasure. It was God found the fullness of Himself in what Christ did. And that's what was pleasing to Him. God saw Christ doing the will that He had sent Him to accomplish. So number one, the cross was pleasing because of the person of Christ. Number two, it was pleasing in the sense about the sufferings of Christ. As we read and Brother Paul read for us in Isaiah chapter 53. He read verse 10 where it said that the Lord would bruise them and put him to grief and make his soul an offering for sin. But if we go back up and we begin in verse 4 of Isaiah 53 where it says He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteem Him as stricken. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him. His stripes, we were healed. And you just read and you see what Jesus suffered. But it pleased God that He suffered. And in His sufferings, this pleasing nature. Let's understand that when Jesus was bruised, the Father was also bruised. And I can relate to what I'm, I can relate in a physical sense to what, what I'm saying here. When Stephanie had to have knee surgery and the first words when the doctors, when I heard she's got a torn ACL, it was like my heart sank because I wished it would have been me. I felt in myself the pain that she was going to have to endure. Brethren, it is that relationship between a father and a child. God Himself was bruised when Christ was bruised. When Christ was beaten, God was being beaten in a sense. You see, it is the pleasure of the Lord to bruise Him instead of us. It was His pleasure to save us through Him. And as the passage reads, the pleasure of God will prosper in the hand of the bruised one. <coughs> it is you and I that will be allowed to prosper through Jesus Christ. Because as we'll see at the end of the lesson, our prosperity includes the forgiveness of our sins. And when we're forgiven of our sins through Christ, we have the hope to eternal life. We have the ability to prosper beyond what we can even imagine. And so, 
when I think about this particular aspect, that is why the Bible says, as the, in the Hebrew writings, about the fact that he is able to save to the uttermost. Look at Hebrews chapter 7 in verse 25. And this discussion in chapter 7 is about the priesthood. How the priesthood under the old law is less than the priesthood of Jesus. But when you come down to verse 25, it says, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who, overcome, who come to God through him. Since he lives to make intercession for them. It is that which God can do through Jesus to save us to the uttermost. Pleasing in the person of Christ. Pleasing in the sufferings of Christ. And then number three, it is pleasing in the mediation of Christ. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And look at verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 5. Paul writing to the young preacher says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. And in case you don't know who it is, what does he say? He says, The man, Christ Jesus. And if you go over to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, as John is imploring us not to sin. But he says, if we do sin, we have an advocate. That's a mediator. We have one who is between us and God who will plead for us, plead on our behalf that the mercy of God might be upon us. It is Christ who is the mediator between God and man. The Father had pleasure in committing to Him, Jesus, all things, all things that pertain to our reconciliation. God had come up with the plan. Jesus must fulfill God's plan. And it is through Christ and only Christ that we have the ability to be reconciled because He's mediating for us. You see, ultimate salvation from eternal punishment was placed in the hands of Jesus Christ. And you know, when I think about the person of Jesus and the sufferings of Jesus and how Jesus is now this mediator, I have to think to myself, What if he had chosen not to please God in his person? What if it had not been that God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased? What about if Jesus had not suffered as we spoke of last week? If you missed that lesson, you can go to our, to our YouTube channel and you can, you can go back and look at the pain of the cross. You can find that lesson. Go to our website. It's there. But what if Jesus had made the choice not to do what God said? And someone says, Brother Ray, he would have never done that. He was the Son of God. He would have never chosen not to be the one to mediate. He had a choice. He makes a choice just as you and I make choices. But the decision and the fate of Jesus was sealed as he prayed in the garden. When he asked the Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He began the process of being the mediator for you and for me. You see, so you and I might not only be reconciled to the Lord, but that we might be filled with with all of the fullness that he has. Go to the book of Colossians chapter 1 and look at verse 19. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 19. It says, For it pleased the Father that in him, in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him 
whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. When I see that it is there in Christ that all fullness should dwell, I'm reminded of Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, where the scripture says, All spiritual blessings are found in Christ Jesus. And it is in Christ Jesus that I can experience the fullness of what God has planned for me. And only through Jesus that I can experience this fullness of God's plan. So in, if it relates to Jesus, the cross was pleasing in His person, in His sufferings, and in His mediation. Now let's go forward a little bit further. And you, someone says, here's where, here's where it kind of confused Kate a little bit. She said, didn't quite understand where I was going. But brethren, for you and for me today, for us to show the pleasing nature of the cross, we understand that the story of the cross is told through His Word. It is through God's divine Word that we can see the story. You see, when God spoke in creation, what did His Word do? His Word took that which, which was void and empty, and it created and turned that emptiness into something. And so that proves the point that His Word will not go forth and return to Him void. And someone says, well, Brother Ray, what do you mean when you talk about the story being told through His Word? Sometimes you and I may not be able to tell what His Word is accomplishing when it is spoken. But I assure you, when we fulfill what His Word says, that it is pleasing to Him. And we can be pleasing in His sight because we have it revealed to us in the story of His Word. But not only that, we have a story, and we have a story which needs to be preached to others. It needs to be passed to others through a preached gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21, to those who are perishing, preaching is what? Foolishness. It's foolishness to those who are being who, who are lost. But to those who are being saved, brethren, it is a pleasing thing. And it is that which you and I can use to convert the world. <laughs> Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says that he is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. You see, God takes pleasure in saving them that believe through the foolishness of preaching. When I think about preaching, when I think about teaching, when I think about <coughs> passing the gospel to others, and I might think, God, you could have chosen a different way. Could you not have chosen a different way than using a mere human to be able to convey the message? That was God's plan. That was God's challenge for us that we can be pleasing to Him that we would learn the story so that we can relate and tell it to those who are around about us. See, it ought to be a comforting thought for all of us that God is actually pleased to save those that believe. Not those who think works will save them. By grace you are saved through what? Faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. This morning in Bible class I talked about this. Imagine if you will, if you did all these works and you had a checklist. And so according to God, you have to do all the things on this checklist in order to inherit heaven. All of us that are here today, if we're honest with ourselves, I always will throw that out there. 
If we're honest with ourselves, we would look at that checklist and we would try to accomplish everything on that checklist as fast as we could. But is that all there is to it? That's what folks who say that you're saved through works, that's what they're saying, you have this checklist. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we are saved by faith. James speaks of this in the book of James. As he speaks about you show me your faith, or you show me your works, and I'll show you my faith through my works. I let my faith be in action. That's passing the message. That's passing it on. You see, that's why if a truly repentant sinner has nothing but faith, it will please God to save them. If you and I believe in the power of the cross and the power of the blood that was shed on the cross, and we put our whole trust and confidence in that, and we live life in accordance to that plan, God's pleased to save us. And that's all he will do. But you see, pleasing God was not only dependent upon Christ. Pleasing God in the story of the cross has some bearing and responsibility for each of us. See, God's done his part. Maybe I'll throw that word out there. Grace. You realize there's two sides to God's grace, I hope. I hope you understand that there's God's side and there's man's side when it comes to grace. God has extended His grace to us. Now we must extend our life to Him by reaching and accepting His grace. Part of accepting His grace is passing the message. And then I alluded to this a moment ago. Through Jesus, we have the story. We're to pass it to others. But as the story comes to a conclusion on the cross, understand that this story ends with the hope of heaven. It is the hope of heaven. In Luke chapter 12, in verse 32. Luke 12 Verse 32. It says, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's God's good pleasure that He is going to allow you not only to be part of the church, the kingdom on earth, but He's going to allow you to be part of His kingdom in heaven, which the Lord Jesus will present to Him as a glorious body. We have this hope of heaven that it must be His good pleasure for us to be there and to make us fit for it. I want you to think about your life. There is not one of us who before we were baptized were fit for the kingdom of heaven with one exception. There's an exception to that rule. None of us who have got to an age of accountability where we know and are able to distinguish between what's right and what's wrong. None of us are fit for the kingdom of heaven before baptism. But a little child that has not reached that age, the Bible says they're fit because they're innocent before God. Brother, when I think about where I am knowing that I didn't deserve what Christ did for me, and knowing His love for me was so great that He went to a cross so that I would have forgiveness of sins so that heaven could be my home after a while. But then if I turn to two different passages in the book of John, in John chapter 18, first of all, look at verse 36. John 18 and verse 36, Jesus answered, 
My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Jesus speaking of the kingdom of heaven. You remember he said he could have called what? 10,000 angels. Or I go back to John 16 and verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And I could, I could talk about that passage for quite a while. But let's suffice and close our lesson. <coughs> saying the lust of this world, it passes away. But the kingdom of God, the kingdom that we're about to receive, cannot and will not be moved. Our title to the kingdom, it can't be disputed. Because the scripture says he will make us kings and priests. He will make us a peculiar people. He will make us a holy nation. And all the other things that come with that. And so hopefully this morning what we have seen. Is it is not our pleasure that matters the most. But it is that which is the pleasure of the Lord. It is that which is pleasing to him. You see, God has no pleasure in our death. He has no pleasure in our subsequent condemnation if we are unfaithful. The Bible says that God wants all to come to repentance. He's given us hope. He's given us opportunity. You see, so as we close this morning, the question, how will you respond? How will you please God? Brethren, if you and I will see that it was pleasing to God about what Christ did, and we know that Christ left us a perfect example that we should follow in His footsteps, what makes us think that we <coughs> cannot be any less pleasing than Jesus was to the Father? You see, the story of the cross... Yes, it's about Jesus and His death and His burial and His resurrection. But on the other side, the story of the cross is about how we react to what He has done for us. This morning we may have one in our midst who's not a member of the body of Christ. And through hearing the word preached and developing faith in that word, knowing that you need to repent of sin that's in your life, leave the way you've been living and begin to live a life that is pleasing to God, you can make the good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We have the water prepared and we will baptize you this very moment for the remission of your sins so that you can rise to walk in a new life. For this morning, if you've done that and your life hasn't been what it should be, and you need to come home. Maybe you started out pleasing God in every way. But at some point, you began to be a disappointment to him. You need to repent of sin, confess those sins. See, your brethren here, we're, we're, we're here for you. Because we want everyone to get to heaven. And we're here to help you. This morning, you know your need. I pray you come while we stand. While we stand. Thank you, the Spirit.